Welcome to Between Data and Risk podcast. Today we'll be discussing how to get actionable insights from data and turn outputs into practical outcomes with our guest, Dr. Tom Ives, Senior Data Scientist at Echo Global Logistics. Stay tuned. If you're a business owner or senior manager, you probably had more than enough about all the wonderful opportunities awaiting you in the era of digitalization. Whether it is big data, cloud, data science, or whatever buzzword is currently trendy. If you would like to hear someone dissecting these claims and showing you what it actually takes to improve business processes, you're in the right place. This is Between Data and Risk, where we discuss real life examples of what works and what doesn't in the world of business operations. Hi, I'm your friendly neighborhood data guy, Dr. Marian Siwiak, and with me is my co-host, Artur Buja, Cognition Shared Solutions Chief Risk and Strategy Officer. Hello. Welcome to this episode of Between Data and Risk. Today we'll be talking about generating actionable insights from data, and we're excited to have with us today our guest, Dr. Tom Ives, Senior Data Scientist at Echo Global Logistics, who agreed to share his experiences with us. Hello, Tom. Hello, guys. Great to be here. Yeah, it's great to, to have you uh, here because uh, until now, Arthur was uh, relying on me to advise him <laughs> how to you know, extract some value from data. And I'm starting to doubt myself uh, after a couple of our last discussions. So With all uh, the questions that I'm asking always. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but I, our audience is mainly senior management and uh, business owners. So let's start with, uh, with the question, what is, what is required from them to derive any value from data? So I guess they, they heard about value of data, or some of them probably even stored. But let's start with the people who just want to start. Like uh, they've heard data is a new oil. Uh, and what do they need to do to actually get some value from it? Commit. <laughs> My worst hard lesson stories are joining companies that were, or joining businesses within bigger companies that were experimenting. And they weren't making a commitment. They weren't investing enough to see a return on data. And it became not just laughable, but like a horror picture. And I... uh, the difference is when you're at a company they know data is important. They know they have to act on it. They know they need to learn how to get returns on it to go to the next level of business. Those business leaders have made a commitment. They're not just experimenting or throwing a few dollars at it. They're all in. They know we either do this or we won't survive. So it's... Uh impossible to just experiment with data, it's impossible to just be a bit pregnant. It's either you're <laughs> in or you're, you're, you're not. No, it's a, absolutely, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree. I've been this, uh, in this situation a couple of time, uh, times myself. Uh, I think- Marion, can we, can we remind each other of one of the greatest teachers of all time, Yoda? Do <laughs> or do not, there is no try. No try. There is no try. Yeah, I, I, I wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly agree. In in world of data, you either you know have your data, you have access to it, uh, you have methods of communicating what you did. If you have just some data uh, and uh, some, let's say, business ear, it's 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 hard. I think it might be a reason why why seventy five percent of one of the reasons why seventy five percent of data projects fail. Uh, unless the statistics change over the last two or three years when I last checked it. Do you, do you have some fresh update on the failure rate? The, the way I would heard, hear it put was that 80% of machine learning projects never make it into production. And a good friend of mine, Greg Coquillo, and I, we developed a talk to address that. And basically, I will make our answer to that very colloquial. So what? The real question is, are you getting a return on data? And a return on data can be had when there's a commitment to it. But I think a lot of people are afraid of the revelations of data. 
Mm-hmm. They don't want data to reveal that the really certain departments aren't performing the way they could. I think you also have to create a safe zone once you commit to getting returns on data. You have to say, look, we are where we are. We're alive. We're operating. We want to do better. So we're not trying to spread guilt or blame here. We're trying to reveal where we can do better. But a lot of people are afraid because of the way they've been treated in the past that once the data comes out, it's going to make them look bad and put them on the chopping block. And I don't blame them for being afraid. It will help if companies will make a commitment. This is to help all of us do better, not to find who we can chop. It's, this, it, this is so funny because the, the second, I think it was the second episode of our podcast, we actually called listen to your data, even if you don't like what it's telling you. And, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's, 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 it, it is the fundamental kind of uh, human nature. I, I, I wrote an article recently uh, about how when people do data analysis, uh, they, 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 they get the result. And they don't really like it. They think, oh, I'll, I'll just tweak it. I'll just tweak it a bit and it, it'll be fine. And, and then they, they tweak it a bit more and someone else presents it and they tweak it a bit more. And by, you know, in the end, what, what comes out is, is really in no way connected to the data that we're fed in. It just makes everyone look so good. <laughs> it's I I I I'm, I can't remember if I told this story or not on 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 the podcast already, but uh, I probably you did. I probably did. I don't have so many stories to tell, so I repeat myself. Uh, I I I I performed an analysis which which showed that uh, one of the business, let's say, units were. Uh, not operating up to the speed, and I've heard from 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 their manager. I don't want this analysis. It doesn't show what I want to see. I just just scrap it. Let's pretend I never ordered it. It's like <laughs> I, so. So if I, you get this kind of mentality, Tom, what? How 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 do you react to it? Because you know people are people, and you know we, we're 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 specialists, but we have to work with people. And uh, what do you do then? That's tricky because uh, it depends on does that guy control whether you stay employed or not? (laughs) Now, if he does and he's not a person of great character, I might just say, okay, and go home and apply to 150 roles through LinkedIn. Um, The other reaction is to look at him with some explicatives that I won't use right now, you can just fill them in and say, are you being serious? Are, are you, are you going to take this chicken approach? Are you just going to put your head in the sand like, like an ostrich? I mean, <laughs> let's deal with this or not. I, I'm not here to, you know, deliver revealing things to you and you not use them. Now, another reaction is uh, to write a letter to HR about what just happened and put it in your desk drawer. Appeal to this person and then go appeal to the person above them and appeal to the person above them. But all the time, I think I'd still be applying to at least 150 roles through LinkedIn (laughs) and Indeed and Glassdoor because I, I can tell you, I've been at companies where data was keen but they wanted to maintain the current technical debt. They weren't committed to trying to automate things that were taking too much time. And um, thankfully, even though some oldies on my team were being that way, my manager was encouraging me to automate the things I was automating, but it made a very tricky environment for me. And I think, no matter where you are, no matter how hard it is, you're looking for returns on data and you're looking to automate as many things as you can. Absolutely. But we, wa- we, want to, uh, we want to talk about you know, de- delivering actionable inputs from data, not, not just outputs. Because uh, you know, uh, an, an output is what the model tells you, but uh, 
then the, the important thing is what, what you actually do with it. So assuming we have an organization that is committed to, 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 to actually delivering some value from the data and they, they, they've ordered the models, they put them in, into practice, how do you then translate the output into an action? Uh, can I counter this? Uh, yes. Not to answer, but uh, I would like to move to this uh, question a bit later because l let's start from the beginning. Like okay. how, how how important is because l we are still at the level that we know that we have people who need to commit. And you said they already ordered the models, which in my personal experience might be like okay, what models where do I put them? Uh, I would like to ask Tom, like, what is the next step? We will get to the question that you are that, that you are asking, okay. Arthur. I, I, I apologize. I just want to, to 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 be a bit clearer in the in the order of the of the things. So you have these people. They said, okay, mm -hmm. we are we are committed. Money on the table. What what is the next smart step to do? In your experience, sure. Um... A lot of people have seemed to like this next analogy, so I will use it. Um, let's say you're a martial artist, and almost every martial art form, they practice forms. They have these rehearsed movements at different levels as you approach different belt levels. Now, a new person that's hypercritical coming in could say, why are we studying these? We're never going to use those in a real fight. We're never going to use those in sparring. And I would not blame a master instructor for saying, shut up. You just got here. Why don't you <laughs> practice the system for a while, and then you give me an answer. <laughs> but seriously, we do those because they increase body skill in the movements when we don't have the body skill yet. I do like Bruce Lee as a philosopher on many points. And he said, I don't fear the man that knows 10,000 kicks. I fear the man that's practiced one kick 10,000 times. When we practice the basic machine learning pipeline, which, by the way, is not taught from what I can tell in most programs, we are going through the basic form of a machine learning project. And there's many aspects of that that we can automate along the way. But the very first point is getting to the data and beginning to visualize it. And when we do that, the data is already sharing a story with us. Talking. We're finding out where we're taking it in in a dirty state. We're finding where it's missing values that are important. And I think it's our job to be diligent to get those things fixed as soon as possible. Why? Let's say we're in a gold business and we have dirty gold and we're trying to sell it. We're not going to be very successful. We need pure gold. We need pure data. As we purify our data, as we begin to visualize it so we can let it tell us the stories it wants to tell us. We need to be sharing that right away. But that's just the very beginning part of developing predictive models. Now, along the way, we figure out which features are most important. In other words, a Pareto of feature importance. We figure that out. We also figure out, did we need any engineered features? Now. I might not know the best predictive model to put in production at that point, but as a federal business person, I'm going to run with that knowledge to my business counterparts and say, this is the Pareto of feature importance, and here are the features we have to engineer. That's more important to process than me giving you the predictions so you can react to them. Wow, thank you. Now, they may receive that and say, I don't know what to do with this. Then let's begin to talk. And that's where the problem is. If the business leaders treat the data scientists and the data specialists as just someone they've hired 
to do an experiment to see if they can get the business to do better, they're going to fail. But if they treat these data scientists as scientists and learn to build the bridge of communication and collaboration, great, great, great insights can be derived. But right. it takes patience and commitment to collaborate and communicate. Uh, but one one of the reasons they said it multiple times in our podcast already, uh, why I am uh, so keen on data mesh, an example, and the part that makes me excited is this creation of data products, which uh, create opportunity to 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 work together for data scientists and business. It's not like central data science team, which is just happening to be around some business. It's a unit where you have business. I'm I'm a big advocate of cooperation, and I also said it multiple times. When our consultants go to any business, I always say, "Be humble. This business operates. They have operating business. Be humble. You may be lucky and be able to to, to help with something, but learn what they do and how it works." Arthur, I'm giving you the stage. I'm sorry. I I know that I'm. No, it's it's you 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 had the look. You know, for anyone who's listening, Marian did have a look of someone who was, if he had any hair, would be shaving it now and following Tom to the ends of the earth <laughs> like a disciple. <laughs> uh, because uh, you know, this is it, I I know from what you're what 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 Marian has been telling me all the time that this is this is absolutely aligned with 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 his views. But I, I would I would still kind of. Uh, ask if if you have this this uh, you know da- data talking to you and uh, it it there, there there are times when you when you when you you say you know it's 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 saying something but it's it's maybe not very interesting let's focus on on getting something more interesting out of it so how the the, the business in often needs to be more literate about about the, Data. You know, we we talked uh, in an episode about raising the literacy, data literacy through data communities. Uh, so, how do do you then work? What's the, what's the next step? Do you then work with the business to deepen their insight, get 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 them to understand more? Because the data may be talking, Great but question. they're they're not really understanding the. Let's use another analogy. Road building, building a really good solid road takes good engineering and a lot of hard work. But it's not near as complicated as building a bridge. <laughs> and okay. this, is, this is, to me, this is the real work. Data scientists have to keep diving deep enough and become good translators. That we speak mm-hmm. Martian and the business people speak business, The business people, let me back up. When I was in graduate school, they were just starting to require liberal arts majors to take some courses like appreciation of thermodynamics, appreciation (laughs) of physics. And a lot of it happened because the people in STEM were saying, you're making us take all these liberal arts courses but we don't see you making any liberal arts people try to build the bridge this way toward us to appreciate what we deal with. And so absolutely the business, they don't need to become expert data scientists. Mm -hmm. They need to appreciate what it is we fight with, what makes our jobs hard, what has gone into giving them the data we're giving them and how important it is, but at the same time, and I hope data scientists listening to me will understand this. I'm saying we need to be good translators. We need to get out of our geek speak and learn to make some helpful analogies. And we can do it, but it's gonna take patience on both sides. Just remember, you're building that road and it's clipping along and you hit the bridge, it's gonna go slower. But the bridge is takes a lot more engineering, a lot more work. So just be patient and gentle with each other as you build that bridge. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so we get into the into, into to the to the point where where that translation, uh, you know, starts that that understanding gets gets built, right? 
And uh, I, again, I don't know, Marian, if I'm not skipping too much ahead, but the the the, the problem the problem that I I always find uh, you know very hard is when when the, the the answer that's coming from the data is not a yes, it's not a no, it's a very solid maybe, and uh, you know it's 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 a range of possibilities, and we we understand probabilities we understand the probability distributions we understand conditions attached to certain answers but the the business is looking you know at i want a yes or a no should i do that or should i not do that and that that's really hard because every decision comes with risk and they just need oh, to appreciate uh, this. You're, you're talking to a risk manager. So yes, thank you. Now I'm shaving my head. <laughs> yeah. I like to put it this way, uh, to because I struggle on. I'm 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 fortunate in that I've been humbled in both disciplines almost equally, business and technical. Even as a kid. When I was starting to try to make money, it was with businesses that were technical and business. And um, it is a challenge. But um, the real spirit here, and this was very hard for me because I definitely lean more toward the technical, is it's okay for your first release to be crap. <laughs> because crap doing something is better than nothing mm -hmm. now that it's in place instead of you thinking you know best how to make it better before you've released it now you're getting important feedback from everyone okay. now you know what you really need to work on now i'm saying this with respect no one's better at releasing crap and then making it better really quickly, in my opinion, than Google. When they first release something, it's like, this is a cool concept, but uh, oh, it's a little buggy. And then by the second month, oh, it's less buggy. And by the second year, I'm so glad I invested in using this, making it part of my product. It gets better every year. Well, that's the spirit. Instead of, now I'm criticizing me more than any of the other STEMites listening out there. Instead of us thinking we know the best release point and we know what needs to be done to make the product better. No, it's not all about the technical functionality. It's about how well it's serving those that don't know our arts. How much is it helping the organization or the business get more returns on the data we're delivering. And a lot of times that crap release, they'll still think you're a hero, but you've just got to keep promising. We don't think this is that great yet, but we wanted to give you something. Now we want to hear what you think we should do to make it better. And that is really hard for a data scientist or a STEMite to ask, but we need to make ourselves do that. We're not building for our thought of what would make it better we're building for what the people we're building for would say would make it better that that's a that sounds so simple but for someone that loves to design and perfect things it's not easy emotionally to do that <laughs> we had a, a whole episode on agile uh, let's say mindset and uh, continuous let's say improvement and uh, when I worked at Sony, the, the analytics team that I led, we, we moved to agile thinking and we, uh, we were just trying to deliver value first and be perfectionist later. We, I've seen dozens of beautiful models which never seen the, the, the light of the day because they've been just, uh, they've been just, uh, Waiting for the perfect perfected. version. Yes, to be perfected. <laughs> so from, from, yeah. let's try to, 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 to summarize. Let's, let's real make quick, a statement. Real quick, Marion, just forgive me, real quick. I sure. love to use this analogy. Um, George Lucas, famous mm -hmm. filmmaker, Star Wars creator mm -hmm. here in our Absolutely. country. I, I, 
I've totally stolen his concept of this and applied it many times to application release. Mm -hmm. But I'll say it, his version. Good mm -hmm. films are never completed. They're only abandoned. <laughs> and we, we need to abandon, at a certain point, it's giving some value. We need to abandon it to a release. But the good news is we get to have new additions or new revisions. Pre prequels, so, sequels. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Spin-offs. <laughs> it's hilarious. So, I've been using Microsoft Word for three decades or more. And I started using it on DOS. Well, it's gotten better. <laughs> a bit. A bit. 3.1? It, yeah, it it's, it's, it's still the case that when you move a picture slightly to the left, there are sirens in the background and the whole world is starting to crumble, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, when you move it to the right, it works just fine. Just right, yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> because m most of our, as I said, uh, audience will be, will, be, will be business people. So you, you need to be patient with your data scientists. Uh, the job is emotionally hard for them remember that uh, but uh, actually I was thinking about this with this communication skills when you said about applying to 150 positions I think uh, it says great great things about your your skill set that you are able to land a job after just 150 applications it's like really sh sh <laughs> oh, could, could, could I, I have data science friends that can do it in less but <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> the question but because I, when I still applied for, 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 for jobs instead of running my own business, I, I was a bit, I lectured communication at, at the university, but this huge, as I understand the need for the communication skills, like from the practical perspective, like do you think that every data scientist needs to be a great communicator or you just need one or two, let's say, in a group who serve as these bridge builders or bridge designers? because. This is something that I must say that I was a bit curious because it like, looks like everybody needs to be an excellent communicator. And I know guys who you know, give them numbers and they will do miracles with them. Uh, and uh, what reminds me of a joke, what's the difference between introvert and extrovert data scientists? Let, let me answer your question with another analogy. Okay. Um, the best music in the world by far is created by orchestra. I, I'm not saying that you can't hear some wonderful music from a simple band that, that's very skilled, like the Beatles. I don't, I don't mean that. I mean, when you want that really intricate music that fills a lot of emotional gaps and tells a story, it's an orchestra. And it doesn't have to be, you know, all the old style instruments. I just mean, there's a conductor and there's a score, and everybody's following it carefully. That's where the best art comes from. Now, why am I using that analogy? I think you're spot on, Marion. There really just needs to be one or two good mm -hmm. interfacers, liaisons for the data science group. But shame on that liaison if they're not faithfully communicating to the data science team. Here's why each of you are doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And as you well know, our safety, our popularity, our bonuses depend on how well we do. I'm mm -hmm. making it known to you what I'm trying to put before the business that's coming from us. I want you to each appreciate how important your piece of this orchestra is. And all of these have to come together in the right way. But Shame on that liaison if he's not grooming a group of liaisons as he goes along. Absolutely. In fact, if it were me, Marion, I would say, no, I, I want a bigger room. I want to bring my whole team. They need to be exposed to this so that they mm -hmm. can do their work better. I would push, push, push for that. No, I, I always took the, the person that, that was, let's say, in my team doing the project, even if it was you know, meeting on, on, on a top level. It's, it's always the person who did the analysis who needs to be in the room and uh, ready to answer uh, the, the, the questions if needed. Uh, mm, but uh, giving credit where credit's due is, uh, 
for me it's it's one one of 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 leadership i don't like this word it's it's uh, very overused people management <laughs> slave right. driving that's right that's why i like the conductor analogy the conductor mm -hmm. knows he can't play the music he can only direct the music a beautiful movie that really drives the point home that we're discussing, Marion and Archer, is Hidden Figures. It's an American movie. It's about three African-American women who are extremely good technologists, math, mm -hmm. uh, computing, uh, engineering, all three of them. And Tahija Jensen plays this mathematician and she keeps pushing these white guys to let her come to the meetings so she can understand what they're battling. They finally do, and it's a game changer mm -hmm. because she's able to deal with it. But she also learned the art of thinking beyond the math and being able to explain why she wanted to take an approach in non-mathematician's terms. Mm -hmm. So... Anyone that can watch that movie, you'll be blessed to watch it. Uh, they overcome incredible odds and prejudice to still make great achievements in their fields. And But the reason I bring it up is just the few scenes where they start to interact with the bigger players and, mm -hmm. and give inputs. Yeah, it's a good example. Uh, I think it's the movie that sounds like... Arthur? Sounds like an interesting one, and uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe this is this is the the the, the, the point where because it's 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 really I'm I'm sitting on this on this question I'm sitting on this topic it really interests me how you how you then turn this uh, the, the 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 outcome into in sorry the output into an outcome because when you, when the when the data scientists when the the the, the, the mathematicians the, the in general the the, the, the specialists they learn to communicate the output of their work into an outcome for the business. It this is when it when it starts working, right? This is this is where it actually gets the the, the proper value. Uh, so, uh, obviously, you know, using your your own analogy, a bridge it has to come from. You usually, build it from both sides. You don't you don't just start from one and and hope it reaches the other side safely. It has to be built from both sides. But there are Archer, let me give you, Archer, forgive me for interrupting you, but I wanted to give you another analogy that I hope you'll love. <laughs> Imagine a water wheel. Okay, all the systems that bring the water to the water wheel and where the water dumps back into the pool and returns the system. Let's call that the STEM side or the data science side. But the mechanical output where it goes and does the real work, let's call that the business side. Mm -hmm. Now, the sad thing is that a lot of businesses, they have the data science, they have the business, but they don't have the water wheel yet. And they have to commit to building that transformation of energy from what's known in the data to what needs to be done in the business. But again, Arthur, there's going to be a different story for that every time. The way the water wheel gets built in each specific situation is the commitment to insist on understanding each other. And mm -hmm. it may take several iterations to finally get to, oh, now I see what you're saying <laughs> on both sides. The data scientists may be going, we've been, we've been arrogant technical, analytical idiots. We see what's keeping you up. And you know what? If we just give you this kind of data, we can imagine you to act on it this way. Oh, no. What we need is just slightly different data, and we'll act on it this way. Oh, of course. And then, But it's the, the work it takes to get to those aha moments can be extremely mm -hmm. painful and probably requires... Not just one trip to the bar, but many. <laughs> so me, this is, this, I don't drink a lot. I just think it's a good over beers, over food, whatever. 
Yeah, it's 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 a it's a proven technique. I I, I agree. But uh, okay. you know, apart from apart from going for a for a pint or two, uh, you know, how how do we build that understanding? Is it is it always try and error and uh, or or are there do do you have some some uh, kind of tools in your toolbox that smooth that transition? The the tool apart from a pint. We- uh, we, we've it seen, sounds like a grease, yes. Yeah, we've seen we've seen this thing I'm going to mention for thousands of years, but to my knowledge, there's only one methodology that comes close to capturing it. But I call it integrating brilliance, and it's the spirit of wow. There's this powerful concept in this realm. Or there's this powerful concept in this realm. But if I abstract it enough, then I can apply it to other realms. I think the table where the water wheel gets built the smoothest is where both sides have immense respect for one another and they are longing to truly understand each other, then the integration of the beautiful concepts almost becomes obvious. But that one discipline, that one methodology that comes close to integrating brilliance is called benchmarking. And Southwest Airlines used it because they recognized back when they were young if we could just turn our planes around faster at the gates, we could really increase our profits. So what did they do? They went and studied race pit crews. They abstracted their processes, and then they applied those abstractions to their own gate, plane into the gate and out process. Transformative. But the reason Southwest Airlines continues to be a leader is because they continually think that way. Could, could you explain this benchmarking a bit more, other than going to 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 to, to racing pit and or I don't know watch NASCAR you know race? Uh, like uh, for, for for the business for, for someone who didn't let's say uh, have an opportunity to to to, to meet it, how how would you explain this benchmarking method? in terms of cooperating data science with with business? One way Greg and I like to explain how to look for opportunities is to say, business people, you do a good job helping the data science team understand what your business priorities are, what your greatest business needs are, your triage of business needs. Now the data scientists can go and reflect on, well, what data assets would we need to give them in order to help them with that? Now, it could be that the third most important business emergency has all the data assets ready already. But the first most important one, hey, we are behind on data we need these kind of data assets to answer that. Let's, let's get a collection program in place for that data. Or it could be we've been collecting that data, but it is so horribly dirty we can hardly use it. Let's improve the data collection processes so the new data coming in, coming in can't possibly be that dirty anymore. You're looking, it basically ends up like a matrix. You've got... Uh, these business needs across the columns, and you've got these data assets here. And now you look for the the strongest intersections and work on those first. But it takes time. It takes a lot of communication. Uh, now, it, 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 it's funny. It's funny how like a lot of these the the problems that you're describing, and a lot of the problems that Marian is always going on about with with data science. This. These are pretty much the same problems that risk management uh, faces with when when encountering kind of hard nosed business. Is because we we both work with 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 models. We work with probabilities, 
and we work with a lot of conditions always tagged on on any answer like right? these are my assumptions these are these are the conditions that would have to be met this, these are these are the caveats and, <clears throat> and you know it, understanding all all of this uh, is is necessary to 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 get the 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 the, the full value of the answer but again like like you said before it it's us who has to the, the the specialists who have to present the answer in terms that the business will be able to consume. So it's also on 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 us. On, on this wanna, note, real quick, so, forgive me. Want to highlight another group that I consider very near and dear cousins to data scientists. They're really a form of data specialists, but they're quality engineers. And these are our black belts that do Lean Six Sigma stuff and all the tools that come with that. They should be listened to at least as much as data scientists and sought for their interactions to make processes better, to make returns on data better. But they are so often neglected, not listened to, not brought into the meetings. It's a crying shame. Uh, our, our methodology, Very our, our our methodology in, in our company, which we apply for 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 for, for our consulting, it's called Trailer, and it's about mapping processes, data, and and risks together, and then these processes can be optimized. And we we learned a lot from from lean methodologies, uh, like how to how to simplify when you have all the parts, you know, all this organizational spaghetti uh, when we are able to translate it into into lego bricks then then comes in the the, the, the lean um, mental state of uh, carving the the, 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 the the useless parts out uh, I would like to ask because there is this trend uh, which I observed in multiple companies when when we discussed with them uh, possible corporations say, oh we have this wonderful business intelligence tool self serve analytics people get the data <laughs> from this data lake and like you know why would i need a data science team self serving analytics that's 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 marian's uh, little bugbear and uh, you know is is that what, a question or you, it, you it, want it, me what's, to your, speak what's your to what's your what's your What's your what's your what's your opinion on the topic? Like for our listeners, like if they if they have this wonderful company coming, we will install you, you know, all, I don't know, Power BI or Tableau or whatever, and your people will be able to, you know, do everything they they need with data. And like you know, we come there and say, okay, how about you know, we we help to align data with processes, do some data science, help you collect the models. No, 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 we are now. You know, installing this self serve analytics, we don't need any help with data science. Well, I, I, I love using analogies for these kind of questions too. <laughs> and I've got a perfect <laughs> one. Let's say uh, you buy a super high end car, but you just decide, I, I don't, I don't want to hire the high end mechanic technician that I'm going to need to do maintenance and repairs on this. So a company comes along and says, we're going to put a state-of-the-art mechanic system, all the tools, all the latest equipment, all the greatest analysis stuff. We're going to install it in a little building right next to your house. And then you can just go out there and work on your car yourself. You'll have all the same... You'll have better equipment than that mechanic, that specialist would have had, that you would have had to pay a lot of money to work on your car. Well, guess what happens? They go out there and they have not the slightest clue how to get started to use all that equipment. In fact, it would have been harder for them to, do, to use that brand new equipment than for the mechanic to go, oh, wow, this is a great new feature. I can... I can really work on this car better now. Same thing happened with finite element analysis programs. They became nice. They had great user interfaces. But unless you knew the theory 
behind how to set up those grids and how to run the analysis, all it did was make a skilled engineer more efficient, more productive. It didn't mean that you didn't still need a skilled engineer to operate it. And this mistake is made by business people who want to dabble, who want to get the greatest returns on dollar instead of the greatest returns on data or process. There's no shortcuts if you're going to just treat high-end technologists, high-end intellects as an expense, you're not going to get a great return from that. They're just going to go where they can be treated better and where they uh, can be respected more. Uh, one, one, one thing that I, that I wanted to, 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 to clarify from the very beginning of our podcast, 75% of products, you mentioned that 80% of uh, machine learning models never get deployed. And so what? I completely agree. But 75% of data projects fail to get return on investment. I'm not even talking about return on data. I'm talking about getting, you know, bang for buck. Yes. It's, and and, and uh, they, they, they don't, it's a, it's a uh, as, you, uh, as you said, it's, it's not getting the return on dollar even. It's uh, it's wasting money trying to save money, which is uh, sad reality. But this, well, hey ho. This this is this is how long it took you to to actually check it while pretending not to not to type on the keyboard, right? I don't I don't type. <laughs> I'm, I'm still you know I, I'm a patient man. I still need to finish my joke about inter, introvert and extrovert data scientists. Okay, well, go go well, ahead. Let's... Let, let me real quick before you do that, Marian, because this will tie in real well to what you just said. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say in one word what you just described. Waste. Blockbuster. Blockbuster video. There, I had to use two words. Absolutely. <laughs> they couldn't believe that their brick-and-mortar system of you drive to our store and you get movies could ever be disrupted. And hey, look at that money we're making on the concessions we sell out of the store. We're mm -hmm. kicking it. They were about to be disrupted and they, they were just going to ignore the data. They, they weren't <laughs> going to invest in a change because we're making plenty of money. People that aren't willing to disrupt themselves are just waiting to be disrupted by someone else. Yeah, it, it, and uh, you know, uh, a, a good a good data engineer. That's just to kind of uh, plug the, the 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 expertise a bit. It's uh, you know, it they're probably worth their weight in gold, right? Uh, for for any business, it's like the the the, the old joke that uh, I I I will tell a joke before before Marian managed to <laughs> manages to push his. You know, it's when 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 a, a guy comes in, a, pl a plumber comes into the house, and uh, there's there's a, a problem, and he he just takes a hammer and goes plunk, and fixes the problem and ch charges the guy, and the the guy says, "What? Well, you know, it's hundred bucks for this this little tool hammer? Yeah, it's one one pa one dollar for striking with the hammer, and ninety nine for knowing where, right? So it's exactly. the, the expertise is is is." Probably always underrated, but it is it is worth uh, kind of investing in because the tools are only as good as the, the operator can can make them. I'm, before I finish, come on, Marian. What is the what what is the difference between an introvert and an extrovert data scientist? The extrovert data scientist looks at your shoes. <laughs> Uh, yes, very good. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Listen, thank, you're thank you for being kind. Uh, <laughs> no, I, ha I have one more question that I want to to to, to ask Tom because we are talking about let's say data scientists being being worth their weight in gold. Like, what's your take on you know I I was doing machine learning and being a scientist myself. Uh, I dare say I was doing data science before it became you know. A, a, widely popular world, okay, because I think it, the, the, the term was coined in 2001, but it took it some time before it took off. But uh, what's your perception of what happened and what still, I think, happens with the sexiest uh, job on the market? So 
uh, the flood of people who finish one, two, three courses. You started saying that some things are not taught in the online courses. Uh, I find it huh, disruptive, but not in the positive uh, way of blockbuster getting you know, busted. Uh, but what's your what's your take? And like, do you have any advice for people who are who want to get data science to? And from my experience. 95% of the CVs that they will get are from the people who maybe shouldn't. But maybe I'm too harsh. Maybe something changed. I, I want to share. Um, there's a friend of mine. She's been a mentee of mine for a couple of years, probably. Yogita DeRay. Mm -hmm. She was being a full-time mom. She decided she'd like to re-enter the job market. And she was overwhelmed. And it wasn't just me, but me and others would encourage many people like Yogita. And we have this spirit of, yeah, welcome to the club. You think that I'm not overwhelmed? I'm just used to being overwhelmed. It's my normal background noise. <laughs> you think I really have a clue of what I'm doing? No, I'm making my best guess based on more experience. And the only way to get that more experience is to hard earn it. So. It's okay, Yogita. Just chill. But how do I do better? I said, and, and, and you said, there's no possible way these best programs in the world can prepare me for everything. Well, that's right. And I'll go back to the martial arts illustration. You can practice the forms. You can practice sparring. But that's not a real street fight. And I, I hope no one ever gets in one. But you do your best at that point. And who's going to do best at street fights? Probably the person that's been in the most street fights. Um, Bruce Lee was always being challenged in real life, and that's how he probably grew the most. But seriously, for us, if we practice with Kaggle and other competition sites, if we go through those courses and we really try to do our own projects for fun on the side, get passionate about something, we're just preparing ourselves better for when a real-world project really hits us. But uh, so I, I know I know Marian uh, always goes about uh, this the kind of uh, th these people who uh, run a f you know attended a few courses online or Udemy or something and then go into into a company and call themselves uh, job uh, sorry not job scientists data, data scientists uh, yes and uh, and it's it's probably because. It, of the, the the Dunning Kroger effect, they they think it's so easy because it looks so easy on the course. So they they they, they have to learn that they really don't know much before they, they learn this humility to to actually then look at the at the real life examples and you know learn that it's not really a three lines of Python that can solve everything. That you also well, need to actually look at the data. There's a spectrum of people that use those type of courses. If you come across someone that's extremely experienced at physics-based modeling and has done it for years, and but they haven't had a real, it's been more of an emphasis on using system parameters rather than using data from some system we can't understand. Well, now you start to show them the techniques and they blossom because mm -hmm. of that other background that's and it's not like they weren't doing data science they just weren't calling it that they were doing empirical modeling they were doing uh design of experiments and ANOVA and, and various statistics you brush them off show them the terminology show them some of the new methodologies show them how to use the libraries they are off and running like you can't believe a smart kid out of high school who goes through one of those courses and calls himself a data scientist, ah, uh, you haven't been beat up by data enough yet. Just show <laughs> some humility and, and beg for an entry-level data science role, or just get a role where they'll let you do some data science on the side so you can put it on your resume. Uh, That's the right spirit. Just to be clear, I have a lot of these courses on my CV, and I'm, I'm not saying that these courses are bad. I I, right. I I finished a lot of them just you know to 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 compare what I know from from modeling biological systems with uh, to to 
actually used uh, used once uh, the system for modeling the cellular metabolism to model to model the uh, procurement the supply chain and it worked beautifully but still there are a lot of absolutely useful things and i think that finishing a couple of these courses maybe it's not a requirement but it helps a lot it's just oh, a, yeah. a, a, a mixing the experience and 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 you know uh, i still hope that one day science will return to data science so with this uh, using the scientific method uh, rather than just putting things into the model you said in the beginning like you know start with looking at the data and i i, I know and i work with data scientists who thought that it's absolutely useless like Okay, I have this model which will select the best, you know, feature selection for me. You know, we have our autopilot now. Uh, Google, we have auto ML from Google. We have H2O uh, uh, pilotless uh, system. So why do I look at the data? This is the danger that I see. But uh, well, Marion, uh, I think you'll agree with this. That person um, that has gone through the conceptual understanding battlefield, meaning I'm going to derive the math from scratch, and then I'm going to code this from the math from scratch without any libraries. Why? Not because I'm going to use that, because I want to really understand it. And they've done that on a few algorithms and methodologies. That conceptual knowledge grows, the abstractability Absolutely. of that knowledge grows, and they can understand Oh, now I get what they're doing with transformers. Oh, let me go look up how they do the tokenization. That's amazing. Wow. Someone else reading that that didn't have that history of developing the math from scratch and the code from scratch, they're looking at it and going, I'm not worthy of this field. No, you just need more down in the dirt practice. You need to build more mud analytical mud pies, okay? And it's a spirit. <laughs> to, to your point, Marion. I, please don't judge me. I only own about 350 Udemy courses. And I have watched a fair number of them. I'm eager to watch the rest of them, but those really help me get up to speed fast in an area, uh, I, I will confess, I had never had the opportunity to work with constrained linear optimizations with integers. It, integer programming mixed with constrained linear optimization. I learned it in a few days just because of the quality of online courses and mm -hmm. my background knowledge. So yeah. then I was able to apply it right away to a problem at work. No, it's, uh, I think we, we started with it. It's like this, this humility and this hum humbleness uh, in, in the face of, of knowledge is, uh, is critical. And this is something that we spoke with, you know, people need to be humble when talking to business, people from business need to be humble when talking to data scientists, and also data scientists need to be. I'm, I'm not saying that someone without the formal knowledge, I don't think PhD is a requirement to be a data scientist. But as you said, someone who was doing, discovering stuff in whatever method it can be, I don't know, market research, is, is if he's humble enough, great material. Yeah. But I think we're... and and, and I, I think we arrived at a at, at a very good place to kind of round it up because uh, the obviously we, we we spoke about how business people <clears throat> need to understand more they become they need to become more data literate and that the data science people need to become more more business literate to join the bridge get an understanding they need to be translators on both sides. And the value really gets uh, get gets delivered then, and obviously you know data data scientists, uh, whatever level they are, it's just like martial artists. You never stop learning, right? And always go back to basics, re reiterate them, and uh, and 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 get better. Uh, thank you very much for 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 that uh, for 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 that data. It uh, and you know. All the all the uh, all the information that that comes with it. Uh, if people want to learn more about you, and and uh, do you have uh, some materials that uh, you know, some contact that you can direct people at? I founded a community called it called Integrated Machine Learning and AI. It started by just being a blog where I was trying 
to fill holes that I saw in the educational space because no one instructor can help everyone understand it all. But in that process, uh, people learned about me on LinkedIn and they started connecting with me. They started praising me as a mentor and as a friend and I was deeply honored by that, assuring them that I was going to learn a lot from them too. But the best way to start a connection with me, and I very much welcome it, is on LinkedIn. Uh, connect with me or message me in one of my posts. I'll get you hooked into our community. We are very committed to learning and growing together. And you'll appreciate this, Marion. Humility is our top virtue. Uh, we we ha have a spirit of we can learn more if we try to learn more together. I couldn't Thank agree more. So thank you. We we will we will put uh, some information on that in the description to the episode. And uh, you know, thank you again for taking the time. It was uh, very informative for us. And let's hope it's of use to someone else as well. Thank you for listening. You can find out more about data science, machine learning, and AI on Tom's blog, integratedmlai.com. You can also contact Tom via LinkedIn. As usual, all links to the references will be available in the notes to this episode. Also, don't miss the next one, where we'll be talking about how to become data-driven. We will be comparing data strategies in practice versus the theory that's marketed to businesses. Our guest will be Liz Henderson, the data queen. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or visit pdr.show to find out more about future episodes and guests. You can also check out Cognition.llc for more information on Cognition Shared Solutions, our services and other events hosted by us. For now, it's thank you from myself, Artur Guja, and my co-host, your friendly neighborhood data guy, Dr. Maja Thank you and goodbye.